This is a real live lobster if you never saw one, and it may surprise you to know that it is green. They are boiled in large out-of-door kettles. Now they are red. Still, after all the abstract intellection, there remain the facts of the frantically clanking lid, the pathetic clinging to the edge of the pot. Standing at the stove, it is hard to deny in any meaningful way that this is a living creature experiencing pain and wishing to avoid, escape the painful experience. That was the late David Foster Wallace in his 2004 piece for Gourmet Magazine, Consider the Lobster, recounting his experience at the Maine Lobster Festival, one of the largest such events in the world. There and around the globe, lobsters, crabs, and other crustaceans are killed in ways that most people would consider cruel if done to a pig, chicken, or cow, including boiling them alive, dismembering them alive, or even eating them alive. But should we feel differently about crustaceans, like these crabs frantically reaching out for anything to grab onto to avoid going into the pot? Or perhaps more to the point, do crustaceans feel pain? Boiling alive. It's a fate that even centuries ago was reserved for the worst or at least more specific crimes. In 1531, King Henry VIII made boiling alive the form of execution for those convicted of poisoning someone to death. But after just 16 years, it was repealed by Edward VI. He looks much nicer, that tracks. Even back then, boiling alive just seems so extra. But today, boiling alive and steaming alive to many are the accepted methods of death for crustaceans like lobsters and crabs, despite videos like these, in which this lobster is seen thrashing against the sides of a boiling pot. This is because some have convinced themselves that crustaceans don't feel pain like humans do, or even like pigs, chickens, and cows do. But is there evidence to support that idea? My name is Dan Payton, and I am Director of Evidence Analysis for PETA. Dan Payton reviews the hundreds or even thousands of hours of footage that comes in from PETA investigations, working with law enforcement and the press to try and get the abuse documented in those investigations stopped. In 2013, we had an eyewitness work at Linda Bean's Maine Lobster, which was a lobster and crab slaughterhouse operated by the L.L. Bean heiress, a woman by the name of Linda Bean. Yep, the same people who brought you those status symbol solidifying monogram backpacks were also, apparently, in the lobster and crab slaughter business dark, but unfortunately, it gets darker. Lobsters and crabs were literally being torn apart uh, while they were fully conscious. The lobsters, their claws were ripped off first, uh, then they were shoved backwards into essentially a steel shoehorn. Their abdomen was separated from their head. Uh, their head was tossed onto a conveyor belt and sent to the trash. The rest of their body, while Everything is squirming, torn in two, and the tail was kept. And the tail was what was sold along with the uh, claw meat. And the rest of their bodies were essentially pitched away for trash. The crabs were also torn apart while still fully conscious. They were shoved essentially face first into a steel spike. Uh, their top shell was then ripped off. That exposed their, for lack of a better term, back essentially, which was just tissue and nerves and that was shoved up against um, a rotating stiff bristled brush and that brush destroyed and, and tore off their internal organs. Then they were pitched onto a belt, taken up a conveyor and dumped very slowly into boiling water while they were still alive and again fully conscious. That's pretty overwhelming, especially for the first ever investigation into a lobster and crab slaughterhouse. So if we take what our eyes and the workers at the plant are telling us, it's clear that these animals were fully alive when they were torn apart, and even hours later. But the question then remains, is the writhing and struggling movement you see here a signal of pain? 
Well, my name is Bob Elwood. I'm a professor of animal behavior at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Dr. Elwood has been studying crustacean species for decades, but his study of crustacean pain specifically started after a seemingly innocent run-in at a local pub. There waiting for his dinner in the bar was a famous TV seafood chef. And uh, so I, I thought I'd tease him a bit, uh, as is typical in an Irish pub. And I said that uh, we have a mutual interest in crustacea. I said, I study their behavior and you cook them. And he just looked at me and said, do they feel pain? And I, th I thought to myself, what a ridiculous question. But I was polite and I discussed what pain was and how it had functions for the animal and it was a possibility. And this got Elwood thinking. Just how would someone prove that an animal, any animal, feels pain? The idea that simply because an animal moves away, if you give it a, 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 what might be a noxious stimulus, is not evidence of pain, because pain comprises two aspects. There is something called nociception. Nociception is the body's perception of a potentially painful stimulus that triggers a reflex response. Think touching a hot stove and pulling back before you've even begun to feel the burn. But that isn't the same as actually feeling pain, which makes the study of pain so difficult. That's the first difficulty. I can do lots of things to crabs that will make them run away. And that doesn't help me <laughs> in, in answering the question. Not to mention that scientists used to think that when crustaceans were writhing about or scraping against the sides of a boiling pot, that it was just a reflex and not actual pain. The general feeling in science before the turn of the century was that these animals act by reflex response. There's no need to infer pain. And I guess when I started, I thought, that's probably what, what it's going to be. And so he knew that if he was really going to see if crustaceans felt pain, he couldn't just rely on a reflex response. Instead, he looked at two main behaviors. The first, avoidance learning. Elwood discovered that crabs would learn to avoid a negative stimulus after just a few trials, which was rapid learning. And I don't think that can be explained by a reflex response. And the second, and perhaps more telling, behavior he examined was called a motivational trade-off. Elwood found that hermit crabs were less likely to get out of their shell after a negative stimulus if the shell they had was of good quality, meaning they were trading off the discomfort with the need to keep a good quality shell. So that isn't a reflex. If it was a reflex, we would see the same tendency to get out of the shell irrespective of the other e ecological conditions. So Elwood couldn't just chalk up these behaviors to a reflex, pulling the hand away from the hot stove, because the response to the stimulus was being managed when other factors were in play. So the old explanation of the actions of crabs simply acting by nociceptive reflex, I could at least say is not correct. Elwood published his findings about a year before Peter released its investigation into Linda Bean's Maine Lobster. So, we asked his opinion. They are, they are dismembered in, in, in some processes without being killed, which is, I, th I, think, I think that's, that's wrong. Uh, I say it's wrong because, not because I know, or I can say that they experience pain, but because I can show that they find treatments such as these are aversive, they find tissue damage aversive. And there is the possibility that they do experience something unpleasant. And just because there is that possibility, uh, some care should be taken. That's a growing sentiment. An Italian court ruled that lobsters can't be chilled, a potentially very painful process before being killed. And earlier this year, Switzerland passed a law banning boiling lobsters alive without stunning them first. The biggest move to protect crustaceans in human history. But could that compassion extend to places like Maine or Maryland, where a recent PETA billboard calling for compassion towards crabs caused an uproar? You do have to take the fight right to where uh, the animals are suffering the most. And then, of course, if you're talking about crustaceans, the state of Maine is, is high on that list. I think consumer attitudes and certainly laws lag behind sometimes what scientists are telling us and animal behaviorists are telling us about animals and that's certainly the case for crustaceans but I think huge progress has been made for these animals and I think it's only a matter of time before Maine and the rest of the United States catches up to uh, those countries in that regard. It's fitting that the same continent that in medieval times was boiling people alive is leading the way to protecting lobsters from the same fate today. After all, as David Foster Wallace continued in that famous 2004 piece, I'm not trying to give you a PETA-like screed here, at least I don't think so. 
I'm trying rather to work out and articulate some of the troubling questions that arise amid all the laughter, insultation, and community pride of the Maine Lobster Festival. The truth is that if you, the festival attendee, permit yourself to think that lobsters can suffer and would rather not, the MLF can begin to take on aspects of something like a Roman circus or a medieval torture fest. Uh, they don't look like us, um, but they sure act like us in the important ways, and um, leave them off your plate accordingly. Tune in next week for another episode of PETA Video Answers, and hit subscribe and that all-important bell to stay up to date on everything happening on PETA's YouTube channel. We'll see you next time.